Good morning and uh, a very warm welcome to this, uh, to our guests particularly who come here, to this very special uh, session with uh, Dr. B.S. Ramachandran. Uh, good morning to all the students as well. This is the first time I'm speaking to you, but we'll of course catch up again later. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ramachandran to you, whom I might add, I've had the privilege, the rare privilege of knowing for, for some time now. I've also had the privilege of doing a long interview with him uh, for the Hindu Frontline way back in 2006. And we have occasionally met, of course, here whenever he comes, as well as in San Diego where he lives and works when I visit California. Dr. Ramachandran is the director of the Center for Brain and Cognition and distinguished professor with the, psycholo with the psychology department in the neurosciences program at the University of California, San Diego, and adjunct professor of biology at the Salk Institute, also in San Diego. Ramachandran originally trained as a physician MBBS from the Stanley Medical College, right here in Chennai, India, then called Madras, of course. Elected FRCP, Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in London. He obtained a PhD from Trinity College at the University of Cambridge, and two honorary doctorates. Ramachandran's early work was on a visual perception, was on visual perception but he's best known for his experiments in behavioral neurology, which despite their apparent simplicity, have had a strong impact on the way we think about the brain. He has been widely celebrated and hailed in his profession by his peers and others. Among other things, he's been called the modern Paul Broca by Nobel laureate Eric Campbell and the Marco Polo of Neuroscience by Richard Dawkins. Ramachandran's early career was in human vision, and he shot into prominence when he published a dozen first author or senior author papers in the well-known magazine Nature, all while he was a grad student and a postdoc still in his 20s, about the average age of the audience, I mean, <laughs> today. David Hubble has said of this vision phase of his work, and I quote, his ideas are bold, irreverent, ingenious, and original. In 2005, he was awarded the Henry Dale Medal and elected an honorary life member of the Royal Institution of London, where he also gave a Friday evening discourse. His other honors and awards include fellowships from the All Souls College, Oxford, from Stanford University, and from Stanford University. The Presidential Lecture Award for the American Academy of Neurology, the annual Ramon V. Cajal Award from the International Neuropsychiatry Society, and the Arian Scappers Medal from the Royal Netherlands Academy of Sciences. In 2003, he gave the annual BBC Wreath Lectures. That's a very prestigious series of lectures, Wreath Lectures. And he was the first physician stroke psychologist to give the lecture since they were begun by Bertrand Russell way back in 1949. He also gave the annual uh, Gifford Lectures in Glasgow in 2012. In 1995, he gave the Decade of the Brain Lecture at the 25th annual of the Silver Jubilee meeting of the Society of Neurosciences. And in 2020, he was awarded the Patrick Wall Medal and Citation for Research on Pain. More recently, the Time Magazine named him one of the 100 most important people in the world. And the President of India has conferred on him the high honorific of Padma Bhushan. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. V.S. Ramachandran. Well, 
First of all, let me thank Sashi for inviting me to give this presentation, this lecture. You've long been friends and colleagues and discussed philosophical matters as well as politics and arts and science. And I look forward to doing more of that in the future. Especially nice to be here at this MS Bulletin Auditorium, new auditorium. I was a great fan of MS and also of a teacher, Shamur, who wouldn't miss a single concert when I was early teens when I was here in Chennai, when he was still alive and active. And one wants to understand how did he do that, this Swara Kalpana and all that? How did, how did it emerge in this bowl of jelly in your head, in his head too? The human brain is almost a cliche to say the most complexly organized form of matter in the universe, at least the universe known to us human beings. And to gain some understanding of this complexity, all you have to do is look at numbers. Brain is made up of little wisps of jelly, new neurons, the structural and functional units of activity in the nervous system. And um, there are 100 billion neurons in the average human brain, 100 billion, give or take a mag order of magnitude. I say give or take an order of magnitude because small cells or stellar cells are difficult to count. But overall, 100 billion is a reasonable estimate. And each of these neurons makes points of contact with other neurons at what, what we call synapses. And these synapses can be on or off, can be inhibitory or excitatory. And based on this information, somebody has calculated the number of elements, number of brain states, number of possible permutations and combinations of brain activity exceeds the number of elementary particles in the known universe. And so given this staggering complexity, where do you even begin? How do you study the brain? One very popular technique these days is brain imaging. Ask him to wiggle his finger. Any volunteer, wiggle your finger, get a scan of the brain, find out which neurons are active. Sounds simple, but it's fraught with methodological problems, as many of you know. Because lots of things are going to go going on in your brain when you think even you wiggle your finger, there's lots of other things going on. So you have to do a subtraction. So you make him wiggle his finger, get a picture, make him do nothing, get a picture, subtract one from the other, then you get the finger wiggling center in the brain. But this is very, very difficult. But, but I brought the idea of discovering the sense of humor center in the brain, if there is such a thing. What you then do is you take a, a Englishman's brain, get a scan, then subtract from it a German brain. What's left behind is the humor center. Sorry. <laughs> the Americans seem very funny. Yeah. But not the Germans. The Germans are really much fun. Okay, so um, how do you go by studying it? One technique which we use is look at patients who have sustained injury, like a stroke, for example, or a head injury, or an infection. But typically, a stroke that affects one specific region of the brain other regions being spared, a tiny region often produces a characteristic cognitive deficit. deficit. The other functions being preserved intact is very important. When you bang into the head, you're going to lose everything. So one specific function is lost, other functions are preserved. This allows you to correlate function and structure. That is the goal of neuroscience. First step. Then find out how the structure is working. That's the even bigger step, which I haven't taken yet. This is what happened with DNA, of course. Heredity, well, laws of heredity, Mendelian laws. First time somebody did anything like science in, in, in biology. And then go on to find that the, the, the software laws. Then he goes on to actually discover, you had to wait 100 years, click and watch something along, discover the actual mechanism. Not merely the laws lawful passing down genes, but how is it done? Crick and Watson was struck by the complementarity of the helix and the X-ray crystallography. Actually, that was done by Rosalind Franklin, but they took the data. And then the effect they found was the helix. Even the great Pauling got it wrong. The double helix, the triple helix, the double helix. And the fortunate collaboration between Crick and Watson, Crick was a colleague of us at San Diego for nearly 15 years, passed away about 10 years ago. Great inspiration for all the students. Anyway, so. What they saw was the not merely describing the structure of DNA, X-ray crystallography, which is important, but the analogy between the 
structural logic of the molecule, complementarity, and the functional logic of heredity, offspring and characters are being passed on to generation. So in a flash, this other analogy, and that day, biology was born, it became science. But we are trying to do the same thing with the brain. When you do this with the brain, with some promising leads there. You don't do anything as spectacular as Krishna wants, but many pro promising leads. So I'm going to tell you about today in the next one hour or so. So let's talk about a specific example of this, the legion structure correlation. Right? So um, this chap, this, this lady, shows up around late, uh, early 20th century at the clinic of a uh, neurologist, the following complaint. She says, every now and then, my left hand goes to my throat and she's trying to remember. That's her only complaint. Fluent in conversation, attentive, smart, and normal memory, all the usual functions are intact. But, okay, so what's going on here? She went in, most of the neurons, she went to, to psychiatrists initially. There's just something wrong with his mother and the usual mumbo jumbo. None of that was, eventually she ended up with the neurologist, Kurt Goldstein. Kurt Goldstein, celebrated, most neuro, celebrated neurologist in Europe at that time. He took about 15 minutes to examine her. Nothing obviously wrong, no neurological signs, but the delusion, desire to strangle her. Then a brilliant example of clinical pathological correlation, he said he knew what the answer was, why she was doing this. Namely, in all of us, two cerebral hemispheres, the brain of walnut and a stalk, each hemisphere has different specializations. Some functions are mirror images, identical, other functions are subtle differences. For example, the right hemisphere is emotion, reaction to situation, very different from the left. Left is sort of uh, very optimistic, cheerful, um, tends to ignore discrepancies. So you have a positive but right now to the point of being almost delusional. The right hemisphere then is very anxious, sometimes depressed, and withdrawn, contemplative, introspective, like poets. Right? Left hemisphere is obviously a CEO. Human, all of human behavior, the whole spectrum of our mind is based on in, uh, the interaction between the two hemispheres. Very sub, sometimes very subtle interaction. You can give rise to this precarious balance too. But when the right hemisphere, the left hemisphere is damaged, right side is paralyzed completely by the stroke. Right hemisphere is spared, so you react appropriately to the gravity of the situation. My God, I'm not going to get better doctor. Can you do something? I heard there's some treatment with mirrors. Do you, are you involved in that? So, right hemisphere reacts appropriately. The patient is depressed, anxious, wants to get better. And this is all known from clinical neurology for 100 years. Then, if the left hemisphere, left hemisphere damage, right, sorry, right hemisphere damage, he glibly plays it now. Well, I had a stroke. I'll play tennis after a few, I can even beat session after a few years. Weeks of practice. My, my daughter says, "No, from small school, plays it down." So the left hemisphere is outgoing, optimistic, in denial. Right hemisphere is anxious, depressed. Now this woman maybe had a stroke in her corpus callosum, this band of fibers that mediates between the the negative affect of the right hemisphere, positive affect of the left hemisphere. Or corpus callosum is, is the mediator. Now maybe this woman had a stroke that damaged corpus callosum. Therefore, the right hemisphere is disinhibited. The left hemisphere can no longer inhibit. Let me back up. Maybe this woman had latent suicidal tendencies in which she was completely normal, but she had latent suicidal tendencies, very depressed, up to a certain point, a few years. Then, but fortunately, these latent suicidal tendencies were kept in check by the fibers going from the left hemisphere, rational, optimistic left hemisphere, inhibiting the propensity to commit suicide or harm yourself in the right hemisphere. Is that clear or should I repeat? So the left hemisphere is more positive and optimistic, it's inhibiting the negative negativity of the right hemisphere. And then along comes the stroke bang, the inhibition is removed. Suddenly you find the patient, right hemisphere controlling the left hand, attempting to commit suicide. Now this sounds like X files in neurology. It's a science fiction, right? And of course, psychiatrists follow the example of the Boga syndrome too. So be very careful to make sure she's not making it up. There's no, no doubt after a week, 
the woman died. Not a lot of time in the cell, but probably the second, second throw. Then he went and conducted an autopsy in the house. He's done those days quite often. Open the skull. As he predicted, there was massive stroke in the corpus callosum alone, no atoms in the brain. Brilliant example of clinical pathological correlation. Each case we study with this gold standard approach that meant play detective, play, play Sherlock Holmes, find out what's wrong with the patient, where the damage is, what is the result of the damage, can you help the patient, can you cure it? These are three dominant questions. That's called gold standard. Example of so, so that pathology, unmasking, uh, sort of, uh, unmasking uh, duality of function. Two hemispheres interact. But you can show this in all of us. You don't have to go to pathological theory. In your daily lives, you can demonstrate your one brain, one person theory is wrong. There are many people residing in each of you. They talk to each other, of course, otherwise you would be one person. But surprising amount of autonomy among these different brain, brain areas. For example, uh, let me give you one, one or two examples. Walking. How do you walk? You move your legs and you walk. Extraordinarily sophisticated ability. Done with basic energy. So let, let's take what when you're walking, let's say you, you move your hands as well. When I'm talking to you, move your hands. Now, these are all mediated by specialized brain structures. For example, when you walk, uh, you have the following experience. People are taught to march. In Royal College, they have taught to march, right? Stand in a row, close the whistle, and march. All you're doing is march, put your left, left, left foot forward, and then the right, left. So, and the right arm swings accordingly. I'm not doing it right, but it's been a while. <laughs> so, the left foot goes forward, right arm goes forward. Then you march. So, this guy, this, you're all standing, normal people. Tiny front row, and you close the when I blow my whistle, march. And you blow the whistle, and everybody puts the right foot forward, left foot forward. But every now and then you get one, one guy, you put the right foot and right hand forward. It's stupid. Well, simple, simple instructions. They're not telling you to do anything like any fancy. They're just saying march. Do what you do every day, hundreds of times. Put, put your right foot forward. But when you give the instruction, you don't do it anymore. Because when you give the instruction, it goes to auditory cortex. From there, the motor cortex which orchestrates a series of muscle twitches and it enables you to walk. So you have to think about it. That's a completely different system from when he's spontaneously walking. He's basically standing on autopilot and he's specialized for walking. So it's effortless when you walk. Mm -hmm. When you blow, you just you start, you do this. Every now and then you have this guy making a mistake. Other example I can tell you would be um, arm movement. Talk about arm movement, right? So when you, you know, I scratch my head and move my, my fingers and my hand. So the volitional hand. So the person has stroke, complete paralysis of the left arm, lying there, and you tell the relatives it's not going to recover much of the function of the left arm. But they come running to you, my God, touch it. I saw this morning, she yawned. What happened? The arms move, both arms move, the arms are not paralyzed. And you have to explain to them that it's not, not unfortunately, it will not recover. Yawning, arm movement, yawning, controlled by completely different center, the brain stem. Increase your volume of tight, t -t air, breathing. But moving your arm, volition is in the cortex. That's damaged, so you can't move volitionally in stroke. But you can still yawn, but in different centers of the body. Now, I can give you dozens of examples from your daily lives of this specialization, division of labor in the brain. But it's not the main thrust of today's talk is going to be a neuropathology, damage to the brain. Specific syndromes, talk about two or three syndromes in particular. First, I'll talk about a condition called uh, phantasm. Some of you may have heard all this before, so you just take a walk and come back. Other section two will be a very strange syndrome, which most neurologists and psychiatrists have not heard of till we, me, Diane, and I, and others investigated. Popped up Paul McGeer, which is called a postdoc in my lab. Study the syndrome. It's called uh, apotominophilia, apotominophilia, an unpronounceable name. Or xenomelia, hatred for your limbs. Or not hatred, foreign limbs, xenomelia. What happened with xenomelia is the patient was completely normal in every respect. Soon after retirement, comes to his wife and says, Maggie, you're not going to believe this. From early childhood, I've had this delusion, I've had this desire. 
I have my arm removed, amputated, removed. And Maggie was upset, needless to say. Her husband told me that he wanted an arm removed. I'm going to explain why that happens. But before that, briefly about phantom limbs. Phantom limbs, everybody's heard of by now, right? Amputated arm or leg, vividly feel the presence of the arm or leg after amputation. Typically, you put them under anesthesia, the ganglion of the amputated arm comes out under the anesthesia, and he says, Doctor, when, when, when you do surgery? Surgery is done. What do you mean? You remove the leg. No, you look through the sheets, the leg is gone, it's chopped. He still feels the limb. How come it's gone? Hmm, call a phantom limb. He's first described by Silas, who was a famous Philadelphia physician, Silas P. Mitchell, who was afraid to publish it in a medical journal because he knew he'd be ridiculed. So what he did was put, put publish it in a he obscured them from the Lipping Court Journal under pseudonym. Finally, the other doctors found it was true. Many patients, after injury and war, amputation, felt a phantom limb. Phantom limb can move, it can shave, not literally, but pretend to shave. He pretend to pick up a glass. And I remember my encounter when I went to Bellow, very curious about these patients. Phantom limb. I saw a patient with phantom limb, seated in front of me, asked him questions. Do you feel it? My arm is still set, still there. How many rooms are Hand is still there, feeling off. Then I said, I put a cup of water in front of me. Can you, can you pick that up with your phantom? I said, sure, I can do that. I can do that. I pick it up. There's a guy with a phantom arm. He's being asked by me. He must have been great Chicago, he's crazy. But to go and pick up the, fan, the cup of water with the phantom arm. So I started to prove what I did was very clever way. Pull the cover. Where did I do that? My question was, with the phantom, can the phantom exceed its normal length? Where is the physical limitation of the flesh applied to the phantom? I'm saying, pull the cover. Yeah! Oh, sorry. I'm a twinge of pain. I said, what, what, what are you? Because uh, I had already grasped the cup and pulling it away from it, and it just hurt. It just subsided. Yes, it's gone now. And that's when I got interested in the robbery. How can a person grab a cup with a phantom arm and feel pain and remove the cup? Then it was buried in my brain somewhere and years later it came to the surface and I started studying these patients. Right? And then one of the things I found was we have seen a patient sitting at the table in front of you. Phantom arm patient, patient with a lost arm a few months ago. I'm going to show you a film clip of this. A blindfold lens and touch his body. Where, where, where am I touching him? On my hips, sir. That's my chest, doctor. My shoulder, doctor. Left arm is removed, okay? Vivid phantom on the side. That's my, that's, wait, 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 that's a phantom thumb. Oh my god, it's phantom pinky. It's a phantom index finger. That's a cute right? Phantom teeth. I feel it in the phantom. Where does this happen? You see some diagrams? Keep going. This way, the neuron. Yeah, pink. Next to pink. Okay, this will clean one neuron. Cell body, the dendrite receiving information from other neurons. Axon conveying information to other, uh, other neurons on the chain. Next, next, next one. Okay, so that's just schematic depiction of the artist's whimsical depiction of the person with phantom limb. Next, next slide. Okay, so if you go to number one, you have a laser point in there. Remove, coke different parts of the brain. You do this for epilepsy. 
Why, where the groups focus is, and you want to remove itself. You don't want to remove functionally normal tissue, you want to remove the abnormal. So you map it. If there's ethical reasons, you want to map it. You need to stimulate different parts of the brain, you get tingling. So I have thumb is tingling, my index finger is tingling, elbow is tingling. Based on that, you sort of draw this map. You've done that with Wilder Penfield, you've done this with Canadian neurologist, created this map. And that's one of the peculiar features. For example, the so general ones have two. Long duration. Oh, good. Sorry. Where can you remember? And then the map. Oh, yeah. You see the map there? Okay. Um, oh, good. It's micro, very tiny little red spot. Hopefully, you see the hand, foot, genitals. Notice some peculiarities. The foot, you know, it's a continuous map. The foot, the genitals are not here, but it should be, you know, as you know. Not below, below the feet, not below the body. Something lost in our physiology perhaps. History. The hand alone is bigger than the entire, almost the entire face. It's a small, right? The, entire, the hand occupies about the same size as the face. Why? I don't know. Perhaps you use your facial muscles and lips quite often. Use your hand a lot. So that's reflected in the brain anatomy. The more brain you get to work, the more brain functions. Right? Now, another peculiar idea is the dislocated the head. It should be near the neck. But in fact, you blow the hand. Why? I don't know. And another thing, the head is, the whole, the whole body is upside down, head is right side up, so there's some dis dislocation there, some twisting and turning of mass. Very important thing, so see. So what they're going on, I think, is basically in the ambulance the arm, the sensory input from the face skin no longer comes to the face. So that face area is devoid of sensory input. It's crying for new sensory input. Brain are gods of vacuum. So then, then what happens is adjacent fibers from the uh, skin of the face invade the vacant territory corresponding to the amputated arm. Arm is amputated, the area is vacant, sensory input from the face skin invades that area. Like that. But so now when you touch the face, the message goes not only to the face area, the brain, but in the hand it activates cells in the hand area. What, what happens then? The message is then sent higher up and, and read as, the brain reads it as, it's stimulating my hand, even though you're only touching the face. So you miss local sensation to missing hand, from phantom hand. So far, so good. Now you do another experiment. It's fun. It's five minutes you learn this anatomy of the brain. Then you take a drop of hot water, put it on his face. Or ice, piece of ice, put it on his, on his face. Oh my god, my, my thumb, 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 I feel cold, ice cold. That's ice cold. It's my phantom pinky. So you get a map of the temperature. It's often congruent with the touch map. So therefore, not only is map, remapping, topography is organized, it's not higgledy piggledy, you know, crazy. Topography is organized. Modality is specific. There's a special, special other area in the brain for heat, the cold, the touch. Not only the touch map is reorganized, but the, the temperature map is reorganized. All of them are reorganized. Separate. Okay? Now, exciting thing, when you put this one one here, you put this ice cube on top, oh, sorry, water on top, ice water. The water started dribbling down my face. Hey, oh my god, my water. So she said, my water is dribbling down my, my arms. Phantom arm, not on my face, on my face, but also on phantom arm. And she had her arm like this, dangling. Then, just for fun, you wanted to raise your stump to the point to see it. What would happen then? What is coming down the face? He said, Oh my God. What is going up the phantom arm to the ceiling? Defying all laws of gravity. So, this remapping is so precise and organized, it's actually going against the laws of gravity. And following a trajectory defined by the flow of water. This shows again how exquisitely precise the organs of the brain tissue, the brain connection in an in, in amputee. Okay. Now, one final point, then we go to the next section of the talk. Okay, uh, the point I'm making is, okay, let's go back. Sorry. I'm going the wrong direction. Can you go back? Oh, yeah, go back, go back, go back. Oh, you yeah. No, next, the pituitary is a good picture. Notice that when we did mapping, all the maps were in the lower part of the face, not, not before, this part of the face, only lower part of the face. 
Again, the map doesn't have any suggestion space. Why would that? Because if you look at the map, it's the forehead that's near the hand. But in a patient, all of the same sensation is coming from, if you touch the lower part of it, you feel the sensation in the hand, right? So either I was wrong, sometimes I'm wrong, either I'm wrong, or oh, pain feels wrong. In his report. I said, well, he didn't search it, so he must be wrong. And I gave the lecture to Stanford, and there was a resident who talked on that. I'm conducting a fMRI, brain imaging right now. I can check the field. My claim was that Penfield has a head upside down. When I looked at his original papers, very hard to get, by the way. No computers there. The original papers were like phone, Penfield, you know, Toronto Library. You know. So then in that, there's a few data points, two or three data points per, per patient, whatever I have in the paper. Statistically, he would have got it wrong. Right? I said, maybe, maybe the head is not really like this. <coughs> yeah. Correct. Original map, the forehead is nearer to the hand. I said, that's wrong, the upside down. Should have been upside down. That's wrong. So the map, Penfield's famous map is found in every medical textbook, every Neurology textbook for the last hundred years, or not the last fifty years, wrong. But they have to rewrite the whole thing, new edition. And put this correct in map, which took me fifteen minutes to discover. That's what's very fun about this business. You get the statistics for the <laughs> disproving <a> colleague. <laughs> okay. Now, next, next point I want to make is uh, I'm going to skim over this, a lot of this order. You know, we also discovered the treatment, kind of pain. Remember, one of, one of our examples is not intellectual. Scientific point is very interesting because people believe that the connections in the infant brain are laid down in the fetus or in the early infancy, and there's nothing you can do to change the connection in the adult brain. Once the connections are laid down, they're permanent and stable, you cannot change this connection. Rubbish. We have shown that in a matter of hours sometimes, in some patients, but certainly in a matter of a week, one week, two weeks, there's a two centimeter reorganization of the map, basic topography, map of sensory of brain tissue. Complete change in the map. So this has to be, uh, okay. now, that's all fine, and what about, so in other words, what I'm saying, adult brain is magnetic plastic. Question is, can you then utilize this, exploit it, for clinical purposes? So one of the things I found was these patients, many of them, phantom arm is fixed in a particular position. They say, fat man, fat man. Well, many of them move. Sir, I grab a cup. Sir, I answer the telephone with my phantom. Sir, I shake hands with you, you're a phantom. He knows it's not real, you're not delusional. Delusional is false belief. Illusion is a false perception. He's having an illusion. He knows there's no cut, cut, cut somewhere around it. But he's a very painful sometimes patient. 90% of the time of pain. So it's clinically very serious problem. So we said, can you find a way to treat it? So when you end up, what your problem? The problem is when you try to move it, exclusively in pain. You know, don't try, sometimes pain there all the time. Okay, then I said, what if you, uh, Let's look at the case sheets because some of them report that they can move the hand freely, there's no pain. Others who cannot move the arm, phantom, I'm talking about moving the phantom arm. Okay? It's itself very strange. How can you move a phantom? That's what they say. Okay? You put the, what I did was, I said, what if you get, what's different about the pain? Different in the, in the case sheets, they often had a pre existing lesion in the brachial plexus or peripheral nerve supplying the brain from the hand. Previously, we did that, some damage in a motorcycle accident, break up with the nerves and yank off the spinal cord, excruciating and painful arm. Then the surgeon decides to amputate the arm for the last measure to eliminate the pain. The guy has painful left, left arm side because the nerves have been damaged. Painful arm, real arm, not phantom real arm. Amputates to get rid of the pain. A very drastic measure if you think about it, but they do it. Then the, what happens the hand goes away? But then he develops a phantom arm, and the phantom has the same pain. So a lot of them are unsuccessful surgery. Then you go inside and cut the spinal cord, or to cut the dorsal nerve roots. It's for the medical students who want Cut the dorsal nerve roots. It's sometimes temporary relief, but no, pain comes back with vengeance. Then you cut the spinal cord, it's a real bold surgery, cut the spinal cord. Then it's, you know, the part that's dealing with the somatic sensation, not the whole spinal then when you find the pain reduction temporary, gone. The reason is that pain is not pain is not here. So they thought the pain comes from here. You remove 
also the Nuromas, better than them. Nor is it any one area. Pain is inside, re reorganization the entire solar sensory system. So there's no point in doing that. I said, this one is simpler to me. These guys cannot move their plant on that level. And they're very, this is very painful. How can you make it move? Mm -hmm. Try moving it. If I can't, so the pain, pain will be worse. So I developed the idea which you call learn paralysis, learn pain. It's almost intact. And every time you try to move it, it's painful. Command pain, command move, no, no pain. Command move, no pain. Command. Now when you have it on, the learned association between the command and the pain gets stamped into the brain. And therefore, any attempt to move the phantom, even unconscious to move them, manifests a severe pain in them. How do you get rid of it? I said, well, maybe you should give them some information, some false feedback, saying it's the fact, this phantom is actually moving with this command. How do you do that? Well, give them a virtual reality phantom. Sorry, which is the hand? The graphics, brain action potentials, hand movements, simulate hand movement, have a moving hand there. He thinks he's moving it. Maybe that will be a pain. So I, went, I called my friend at Caltech, Christoph Koch. I said, you're, you're, Can you set up a virtual reality system so that it takes the EEG signal, new, new rays, and makes the phantom appear that it's moving? It was outlandish idea. He said, You can do it because of $1.5 million. Uh, close down, close shop, did that experiment. Then I said, well, you, you use a simple mirror. You put a mirror in front of the guy, you put this phantom on the left side of the mirror. On the right side of the mirror, you look at the normal, reflection of the normal hand. The picture is there. Left hand is gone, you see the mirror of the right hand. Then he said, move both hands symmetrically. Like wave goodbye, clap, do whatever you want. So I can't move my left hand. Well, I said, try it in it. Put the phantom, move the, or whatever. Phantom looks like it's moving. Immediately he said, my God, the phantom has come back. I can see it. And it was back. Move it, move, move it. Oh my God, move it. My phantom is moving for the first time. It's dumping up like a little kid. And I said, does it bother you? Does it hurt you? No, 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 it doesn't hurt me. On the contrary, the cramp is gone. I feel like I move my hand freely and it's wonderful. And I said, that's great. I mean, the, my theory might be right. We learn paralysis. Visual signals are being artificially sent to the brain, and that's causing the movement of the phantom. It's relieving pain. And I said, Why don't you take that by sit? Or close your eyes, now do it again. Mm. Ah, painful. I don't open your eyes. Oh my God, no. Now, my theory is right. I mean, you need to, you can't carry a mirror around all, 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 everywhere you go, right? Mm. But what if you train him in the mirror? Every, every day he's using that to rehab. And then maybe you can dispense the mirror. So I told him that, and he said, sure, I tried, sir, for a long time, for two weeks. So he took it from home, and he, after one week, I told him that anyway, I said, it's wonderful, and I put the mirror, move my hand, I'm showing it to my girlfriend, reflection moves, and he feels, I feel the relief from pain, but nothing happens to me, pain, when I close my eyes, I need to get a vision of it. And we keep trying, you know, for us, five hours, I just keep trying. He kept trying, and then he phones me all agitated. We get the two weeks now. Count on very much. My sir, you're not going to believe it. Can I come and see you? By all means. Come, came back. He said, you know, what happened was that after two weeks, it's gone. I said, what part? I said, the box was gone, the mirror box. I'll give you another one. Said, no, no, no. My hand is gone. My phantom hand is disappeared. I said, what are you talking about? Does it bother you? No, human, you worry about human subject ethics or permanently change the human being body, body image. No, no, on the contrary, I don't have a fa phantom arm. There's a pain, phantom wrist, phantom arm, all the pain is gone for the last two, three days. So I'm very grateful here. I said, okay. But, sir, my phantom fingers are still there, dangling from my shoulder. It happens in neurology. Fingers, and they're still painful. Can you change the design of the box, mirror box? Reach my face, I said, oh, okay. maybe that's really pain. I'm sure if we try that, pain is really guy's happy. That was about 10, 15 years ago. Now adopted by tunics throughout the world, this technique, miracle. Now used even for stroke, honestly, number of other syndrome, you don't talk about here because you're not a medical person. Next slide. Sorry, In part two of the talk. This is about mirror neurons. I don't think you have time to go into it, so I don't skip it. It's very fascinating talk. In discussion, it comes up.
back to the Prats area, come back to the amygdala and the insula, different brain structures, you don't have to remember the names like that. From that, the anti-similar, in the pain or discomfort, normal sequence of that. So maybe this guy has lost his age. You know, look at that, but he's galvanic skin response, measuring his uh, response, sweating. It's the same sweating as in normal. You found that he is normal. Or it could be less sweating, that means the area is affected, the pathway is affected. Maybe that's causing the disease. Sweating is going a bit fast, it's slow down. Okay, let me slow down. So if I'm saying something too fast, or just raise your hands. No, no, I'll repeat it. Okay. All right, so, so basically we said there's a disconnection between the brain and the hand. If that area is damaged, therefore, when you measure that, you're not damaged. But, and higher up, here is the protection, it's called STS, superior temporal sulcus. There, the superior, 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 oh, inferior module, no, superior parietal module, superior parietal even I forget these names. So you go there, and there's damage, and that did not receive the signal. See, that was just damaged, that area was, was messed up. So what happens, this guy has signals from all over, all over the body, he goes into the next parts of the body map, which is southern here. The map. Then it goes to the, from the body map, it goes to the central area, S1, S1, S2. Then it goes to the Superior uh, temporal gyrus, sorry, superior parietal gyrus. I don't know what it's called. Maybe my age is different. So that, that area is, is, is blocked. So the signal arrives, there's no place for it to go to. So now, huh? The brain says that they would shut up. There's a discrepancy signal, which then gets into the amygdala and manifests as an abhorrence of the limb, which is removed the arm. So when you know, I, I'm happy to the arm, the guy says, uh, contrast this. Observation of ours, we actually discover brain lesion, we explain how body image is constructed. This region gets polymorphic I'm standing there doing all this. Polymodal sensory input, visual, tactile, auditory, all this converges to the one area. Superior right? That area is then the master, master area. You see signals from all parts of the body, visual, auditory, vestibular, understand. But all of that goes to that area. That area, therefore, is damaged and it's in front of it, and then you abort it, so essentially, and then you do that, and then you and then you remove the arm if you're normal. The guy, the arm was removed, he didn't lose anything, he removed his arm, came back, a very happy man. For the first time, he's very happy. You've seen a number of patients, right? very happy. Contrast this to the earlier theory of Freud. Freudian theory of Freudian theory is that guys cry for attention. To have amputees not cry for attention, it's idiotic. Why would it be drastic to them? Just remove your nose or remove your ears, fine. Why your arm? Very drastic. They didn't, they didn't. But secondly, if you ask him, how much of your arm do you want to amputate? He'd take a felt pen, draw a line around this, and say, exactly, precise location of amputation. If you get one inch wrong, come for a second amputation. The precision shows it's not some psychological mumbo jumbo, it's some physiological. That's what clued me in. And discover the anatomy of what's going on. Second piece of evidence, second theory, Freudian theory, is that this is basically a Freudian theory saying the guy amputates the arm to develop a big amputation stump which resembles a giant penis. I'm not making this up. Who reads the book? I'm not making this up. Psychiatrists are saying this because they want a giant penis. Again, I find this very you know, unlikely. Maybe some truth to it. Okay, so we talked about two symptoms uh, and their explanation. Now I'm going to talk about the third one and we're done. Do you have about 20 minutes? Mm. Okay, I'll try and rush through. Tell you about the brain structures, mirror box. We can come back to this during discussion more. It's interesting. Interpersonal darkness is tickling. You can tickle a phantom limb. That's the teaser that we'll talk about in the time we <laughs> discuss it. Both of you are doing declarable syndrome, Carl Quinn, and your student syndrome. Opposition defines it. There's one or two more of them. Francis Gaudin, cousin of Charles Darwin, first cousin of Charles Darwin, brilliant man, also misguided, believed it was racist. Racist, right? 
In fact, he, he was childless himself. I don't know. <laughs> Just was that. Okay, so then anyway, Franz Gordon uh, is contributes to statistics. It's perfectly valid, useful. Biology is dubious. But one of the things he discovered was the phenomenon of synesthesia. So about one out of 50, one out of 1,000 people, one out of 700 people, the following peculiarity in the vision. Every time they see a number or that is an abstract, they see a particular color. Five is red, six is blue, seven is chakras, eight is indigo, nine is yellow, so Every number is a color. Every, so where does it happen? Document it, so it's stable. This number of color is stable, documented, published. Then no, nothing was known about it for the remaining 100 years. People said, another case of Carlton synesthesia, another case of synesthesia. No, nobody studied it. You know, doing experiments is very rare. I don't know why. It's changing, but, but it used to be that. Anyway, so they didn't really study it properly. So the first, first, first question we see anyone is, is, is it real? They're making it up, they're trying to draw attention to stuff, or is it real? Number one. Number two, if it's real, what's causing it in the brain? What chain circuit in the brain is causing it? And then the third step, can you help it? Can you cure it? That's the three steps. Is it real? What is the mechanism? You do it with every syndrome you see. So we did phantom limb, phantom limb pain, we did that. The Clarenberg syndrome, we have not done that, obviously. Now we come to this phenomenon called synesthesia, where people see colors and numbers. Or they see other things, they see uh, personality, and numbers of personality. Emotional creates, evokes an emotion. That's the last part of my research. Okay? But how do you know it's real? Well, we do some simple research now. You just put a, a Okay, so this is an example. Why is green easy? Okay. So you ask obvious questions. I want participation audience to be in questions about something. Why are you interested in it? Who cares? Somebody says numbers color, who cares? Arcane research that you guys do. It's very important. It's going to tell you about how basic of creativity in humans. I did that later on. Now, so one is not severely impoverished like this. All you do is uh, matrix like this. So you've got students in my class. First of all, Carlton is wrong, but incident. One out of one out of hundred people since one out of hundred. The two of you, the closet since you wanna come up. Come and see me after the lecture. You see numbers of color, okay? So you've got the two was red and five was green. Oh I say, okay. Let me put this thing like a traffic color vision test, right? Five is red and two is some two is embedded in that. Green. Can you see them? How many do you see the two? You can see them now. It's hard. It takes several seconds. You're the synesthete. You see, oh, yeah, I'll start trying it. You can try on square, or so, 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 what state you're trying it. it three times as fast as you and I. He's crazy, how many of you are better, better at it than us, right? He's literally seeing the colors. He said, what do you see? You see it on the letter or in the He said, no, I see it on. So there are two types of senses, projectors and associators. See the mind's eyes, I see it. I always tend to have a feeling of redness when I see it too. I don't see it on the paper, don't be serious. Others, minority, I see it, but just as clearly any green, the green, the green color here, the matches on the green. But I know it's not green. I can see it like veiled, I can see the real color, black, but covering green. Now, so the whole lecture on this, I'm going on, I'm not going to do that, but I do want to show you something. Where is it going on? What is it? Is it real? It's shown it's real. What causing it? It's causing, what's causing it? It's the following. They found that since we found that since the runs in families, so did Galton. So confirming Galton. Runs in families controlled by the Mendelian principle of the inheritance. Maybe since he's a gene, a set of genes, it's causing this problem. Why is this important? What is the last point? What the gene does is the following. How does it produce synesthesia in some people? One, but one person will publish. All of us in the little fetus. In fact, excess connection between different brain areas. Brain is modular. You have face area, you have hand movement area, you have uh, taste, all the different senses, sensory processes, hippocampus, many series of hippocampus, hippocampal uh, neurons, in space, in memory, all that. A lot of specialization within even the simple structure, throughout the brain. Now, what we said was, maybe in the fetus, the division of labor has not taken place yet. Everything is connected to everything. But 
when the fetus grows, the brain will develop, be a connection, the excess connection is pruned away to develop the characteristic modularity of the brain. Different structures, autonomous, hardwired, each performing its own function, independent of previous. These are all excess connections removed and the modularity develops the adult brain. But the gene that produces this pruning is mutated. You don't get the pruning. And if it's expressed specifically in the specific brain region, you get a uh, form of synesthesia according to which region is damaged. So if you get number colors, I was struck by the Ed Hubbard, my grad student, and I were Hubbard by was impressed by the brain. The area that deals with number discovered the sinus goes behind and, and Tim Rickard in, in our center. That's the circular area. Now, number is great green in the number area. And the fuses from gyrus and temporal lobe, part of the temporal lobe, fuses from gyrus, handles numbers, visual appearance of numbers. The color area is right next to it. Number area is red, color area is green. Color area is mapped by severe Zeke and others, brain imaging, lesion studies. That's the color area. Right? Number area I've drawn in there with felt pen is discovered by various groups. How come they're right next to each other? Maybe in the fetus, they're next to each other, they're active, but the adult whittled, uh, whistled away, creating modularity. But if that gene is mutated, they remain connected. So every time you see the number, you see the color. Is that clear? In the normal fetus, everything is connected to everything, crudely put it. The number area and color area are right next to each other, they're connected to each other. So every, every fetus is a synesthesia. And everything is whittled away except that pathway. There, uh, in, in sense, the pathway remains intact. Therefore, you get sense in number. How do you know it's true? Brain imaging, in the normal people, you know this, you get color area, but writing black and white, you don't get color area. You do numbers, it doesn't get it. If you put not color numbers, then in a normal person, you get both of them. If you, you put black and white numbers to a synesthete, you get both ends. So you can do anatomy and physiology in the same preparation, do psychophysics, and draw important conclusions. Now why, why, why is this any? Why should you go home with any memory of this observation? Complete waste of time when some guy is finding color activity in it. It's very important. Why do you walk what makes us human? Now imagine that gene that is expressed not just in a few from virus due to uh, other enzymes acting, but throughout the brain. Then you get a hyperconnectivity throughout the brain. One of the things people observe about in synesthesia, an observation made long, long ago, we confirmed this, is eight times more common amongst poets, artists, and novelists than in the general population. Eight times more common synesthesia throughout the brain. Many people with noble code of synesthesia, Kandinsky is going to be a lot of examples in the literature. Now, what do they all have? What do these people have in common that uh, other people don't have? Art is supposed to know this quickly. Art is supposed to know what they have in common. They all put it in metaphor. That's crazy. You say, it is the east of Juliet to the sun. It is the east of Juliet to the sun. What do you say? You don't say it's a glowing ball of fire by the sun. No. You say it's radiant by the sun. She's radiant by the sun. She's um, warm and nurturing by the sun. She rises in the east, the sun rises in the east. This is a celestial figure of the sun. Here you go on like that. Shakespeare was a master of this. Suppose I ask any one of you, very quickly, ask one of you, to give me a metaphor, a good metaphor, for uh, the overdoing, doing something in excess. India is a preeminent journalist, so I'm going to avoid asking you, but ask one of you, anyone, any one of you, to give me a good metaphor for overdoing something. And don't worry, most of my friends won't be able to do that. Answer is very simple. To, to throw perfume on the oil, to build refined gold, to smooth the ice, to add another hue to the rainbow is wasteful and ridiculous. How did he think of eight in one line? I don't think he sat there and said, we didn't do that. In a flash, Master analogy and metaphor. Why is he like that? What I'm saying is the same gene promotes creativity. This cross connection, metaphor is taking an idea from one domain 
beautiful young woman. I know if a man is sort of sister, so apparently nothing to do with each other. But you see a common denominator. Love it is an abstract. Is human human that is special good at abstract to abstract. That thing goes alright, I mean, well, in this case it helps. Because what I'm seemingly unrelated ideas, you the sense in brain links and, and you get beautiful poetry or art. So, so that's the explanation. Now why why is how does this occur? Why is it not more widely known? Why don't all, all, all of us have sense in right? It's so good, why don't all that? Answer the evolution takes time. Here another fifty years, or another fifty thousand years, or another million years, hundred thousand years, all of us will be sense. <coughs> Create, imagine. Another reason too, you don't want everybody being creative and managed. You want engineers or neurosurgeons. You don't want your neurosurgeons being creative. Okay. So you need all, all types. Not, I'm not implying neurosurgeons, not managing neurosurgeons. Right. Something along those lines is going on. It's like a sickle cell anemia. There's a hidden, what I'm saying, a hidden agenda for the sensitive gene is creative. Okay, next, next point, the last. Where is my okay, so, okay, yeah. Can I spend five minutes on this one? Yeah, sure. Another type of synesthesia is calendar line or number line. Again, I need something called calendar. Some people in the population use that. I mean, ask to visualize it. Days of the week. But these are numbers. You know. Let's take where days of the week are mainly about days of the week. They say, well, how, do you, how do you draw a calendar? You know, uh, January to Jan, uh, December. How, imagine, how would you imagine a calendar? Most people say it's a flat sheet of paper in front of it. One, you know, January, February, March, April, June, June. January, left corner, <coughs> December, right lower corner. Is that true of all of you? Or? Yeah. That's generally true. Maybe about 2% of the world is not true. I said, my camera makes this a hula hoop. Around my waist, January, February, March, a hula hoop. Or it's a T junction. Or shaped like a K. Well, not only K, like you. Shaped like a hula hoop or shaped like an L, L shape. With the limb of the Lord in the point in the opposite direction. Why in heaven's name would somebody see calendar with an L shape? That's precisely the kind of problem that attracts me. Because people ignore it. I think it's bullshit. But if you show it's real, then simple experiment, then you don't know the right track. Why but he also said the lower calendar is the projector calendars. I can see the font form. What do you mean? You see the Helvetic font. Aerial form. Monks labeling this calendar in front of me. All of a sudden, in an enemy sense. Where does it come from? Why the form? Why is it around your chest? Some of them goes behind me, scattered. Some of them are August, September, August, September. So we tell you that. Now, people think they're outlandish, but I want to prove they're not outlandish, it's a real phenomenon. 90% of it is figured out, but it's still, still not a lot of work to do. What's going on here? First of all, it shows real. Same, same problem. So it shows real, and then we get up. What is the significance to all of us? Why do you study it? Real because you do the following experiment. Let's right say I see January 29th. How do you know you're not making it up? Anybody wants to hazard a guess? Very simple. I want you to close your eyes, put, I'll just this, or even open your eyes, and then tell me, recite for me, the alternate months. Let's take one of you. How about the guy that? Ah, oh, of course. Nice. Yeah. You want to try? No, you know, you know about the experiment. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Oh, you try. You also know. Anyone? Almost one. January, March, April, May, June, July, September, November. Good, good, good. All done. Yes. So, no, December, October. February is backwards. 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 Oh, anyway, so do I You're good. You're better than average. Most people are awful. This guy's weird. I'm just reading it. Just say it out loud. No problem. Effortless. One third speed. How is that possible? Because they're, 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 they're made in front of them, like printed on a sheet of paper. They read it out. So they read it out. It's very easy. Okay, but we, we, only in terms, you can't do it algorithmically. You do it spatially on the map. You cannot do it algorithmically. If you do it algorithmically, they're like you. We get it slowly, you know, not a mistake. So you do it with the calendar, the calendar line of synesthesia, to go backward as fast as forward and faster than both the, the normal people. So this show is a five minute experiment, what people have struggled with for 100 years, shows real. This is bullshit, nonsense, there's no such thing. 
Other people say, no, it's real, but it goes back and forth. This is from truth. This is not. Okay. Now, next question is, why, what, what happened? Why, why does it happen? Okay, some peculiar features here. It's a body. What I mean by that? You're asking the woman who said February is not a day. I don't say August is not a day. I said, why do you think a day? Stop saying June. September is a month. Now I said, okay, you want me to look behind? I said, what are you talking about? You look behind. I said, you want me to look behind? And put her head, hold her head and twist it. He's all breaking it. Tell me it's uncomfortable. No, no, you. Shh. Oh my God, for the first time in my life, I'm seeing you seeing those hands. But first time in my life, I never tried pushing my body down. Where the hell is it coming from? They're not real workers in the mental space. And, and then another example like that, which is uh, even more interesting. He was the same, same with the other guy. Now, why does it happen? It's to do with the way the brain maps different domains. When you want to create maps of time, humans, for a calendar, calendar is vitally important for human beings. Now, uh, however, animals do not do the time sense out of scratch. Clock, you can't do it. In evolution, nothing can be done from scratch. You use pre existing hardware. You do clues, you do makeshift arrangements of pre existing hardware. So you've got, fortunately, spatial maps, hundreds of spatial maps in your brain. Some of them are not, not even used, useless vestigial maps. Take one of those and map the time on the space, what do you do? Can and punctuate the weeks, days, week, number, all of that. Okay, so that's, that's how the calendar is. Okay, so, uh, all right, let me end with you. Oh, sure. Another lady with Mobius, she got a calendar like that, U-shaped, but she cannot read the one on the right to the top. Why is that? When the exam is she said, wow, walk behind the calendar. Said, walk behind your calendar. Said, what are you talking about? So okay, I'll try. And she can actually walk behind the calendar. She said, well, now I can read those. Why? Because they're, 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 they're mirror images, mirror writing. Because there's a Mobius strip like twist in front of them. And then when you put them in parallel, and you go behind it, you have to read them to the front and become the man mirror of us. This is a red from the last point. Because Mahesh and I talked about this during the discussion. Hippocampus is the structure and basis of the brain. It's involved in the instruction based brain involved memory, uh, and it has. Very, very peculiar features. If we have two, two types of cells, which I'll tell you about later, maybe next, next year, right? Uh, okay, so one of the things I just want to mention is numbers also been described by other people, not just colors, but personality. And we all have a vague feeling of personality, numbers, but not even vivid. These people are very vivid, very specific. Arrogant son of a bitch, seven and arrogant son of a bitch, who does this crazy stuff, but he's very shy. How many arrogant? Some strange combination of traits. But I know where this is part of the brain's involved, I'll tell you later about it. So anyway, it's again a real phenomenon. If you put them next to each other, you put one person and put the number color, five is red, six is blue, you put the five to 56, the colors change in spatial interaction. Same thing with personality, even more compelling. So you have one last line. Okay? One number is lust, six is lust. This Subject we, we've seen. Three is um, affection, agape, love. If you bring them close together, they start interacting. They're both now romantic love. Because romantic love, you need two components lust and friendship. Without either, you don't have romantic love. When you put it together, right? when you put a line below between them, you measure them, right? you measure the situation, you see, measure it. And three is between lust and between. Interaction producing love. And put a line, the interaction stops. Why should a conceptual interaction with love, love and affect be blocked by a physical line? Metaphorical separation by a line creates a perceptual division of emotion, right? And that's and that's all. I just want to say it's interesting to approach this very difficult question. Uh, Using very simple technology, simple methods, studying page This is a gold mine. Chennai is a gold mine. In fact, all of, all of India is a gold mine. Both for us and the patient. 
Und die anderen gesagt, wir wollen Metal Call, wir fangen den und sagen mir, sagen mir ein E-Mail. Das ist strange, ich so. Wir machen gar nicht, das ist strange, ich brauche. Ich starte mit diesem Kochi Experiment. Talk about mathematics, origin of numbers, origin of pain, curing pain. All these problems, domain of philosophy. Like the line being drawn there, blocking conception of fact, very strange. You know, Ramayana, Lakshmana draws the line. Line is much more important than you realize. The world is something that lines delineate objects. Perception is about finding objects, we label them, identify them, create emotions. You know, you know what it is in an object, separate objects. This is separate, it not belongs to this. Separate. Segmentation, very difficult. But the segmentation involves outlines, that's why outlines have such a powerful role. They draw an outline, emotions stop. Start thinking about these issues. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a lot there and as always he, he's full of information and energetic and brilliant about it and uh, uh, for me it's like a deja vu. So there was a lot there, there was phantom limb, there was synesthesia, mirror neurons you couldn't go into and there's this whole... Uh, so questions, doubts uh, related to, to more or less. Yes, go ahead sir. If you'd identify yourself, I'll be useful. Yeah. There'll be a microphone, just make sure you have it in your hand before you ask the question. Hi sir, I'm Don Tomsley and uh, my question is, which part of the brain deals with stress and what sort of chemical imbalance, if any, uh, while undergoing stress and how much of a chemical imbalance can the brain counteract? That's basically it. I know it's not connected to your... your I, can, I can hear the... Can you repeat? Repeat sure. it slowly. Yes. Slowly. Which part of the brain deals with stress and what sort of chemical imbalance uh, does stress cause to the brain and how much of a chemical imbalance can the brain counteract, if any? Okay, you talk about chemical imbalances, what's causing profound changes in behavior, obviously it does, right? And he wants to know which part of the brain deals with stress. I, I'm, I'm speaking to you. He wants to know which part of the brain still deals with stress and how is that handled and, right? Something like that. Yes, sir. Well, not, not something I study. Yeah. But I can tell you from synesthesia, for example, synesthesia, profoundly influenced by chemical mis misuse of or use of drugs, like LSD, yeah. produced synesthesia in an otherwise normal person. And very important because people used to think this is nonsense, there's no chemical. People used to tell that. Pot, pot, and maybe uh, I don't know, I, other drugs. I won't mention. I don't want you guys to find it. So these are drugs that can produce something. I didn't believe it till I found really data. Much more common in JNU than uh, in Madras University. And totally non-existent in ACG. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for this. Excuse me, sir. Just uh, one more question. Just uh, shall we just see if there's someone else? I'll, I'll come back to you. Okay, okay. Okay. Right. Can you raise your hand so I know who's? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. No, can Can she? Oh yeah. Go ahead. You have the mic. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, good afternoon, sir. Thank you for your rather ingenious and very thorough presentation. Um, there have. Been I mean, disembodiment, embodiment are actually quite some buzzwords in contemporary times, especially in critical race studies and feminist studies. Mm, my question is that one of the critiques, um, one of the critiques that has been given by disability studies of um, neuroscience is that there's a certain pathologization of certain human conditions that is done in, on the based on the assumption that there are there is one normal human condition and any aberration or deviation from it needs to be in a way corrected. So I'm curious about if contemporary neuroscience is responding or integrating this kind of critique from other disciplines and fields of study. I heard most of it. I'm saying that neuroscience has a tendency to label and uh, I don't realize tremendous variations you see that the 
also that is, it is based on a certain kind of separation between, um, say, persons and bodies, and like they're extracted in a way from community and non-human kin and place of being and all of that. Well, I mean, reductionism is what you're talking about. There's too much reductionism, perhaps, and not adequate emphasis on other principles, human, other approaches. But these are not, these are not conflicts. These, these approaches, humanistic approaches, or scientific approaches, can complement each other. They don't have to be in opposition. If you say dualic design, or if you say um, you describe sexuality or attraction in terms of chemicals and neurons, it does not detract from your experiences with sexuality or courtship. On the contrary, it can enhance. I say, say this in my book in detail. I talk about different directions of time. You, when you explain something, you don't explain it away. <coughs> Remind me of a joke, but I'll, I'll save it to you later. <laughs> uh, go ahead. I think she, she had a hand first, and then, then we'll, I'll come to you, okay? Yeah. I'll come to you a little later. Yeah. Go ahead. He's also very Sometimes people who have schizophrenia get illusion in which their cognition tells them something is crawling up their body or, um, or tickling sensations. So can neuroplasticity or delusion, uh, neuroplasticity or placebos work in this case? case. Sometimes people who have, can you repeat that? Schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, huh? Uh, get tickling sensations. So can neuroplasticity or placebos work in such cases? Uh, they have tickling sensations. Can yeah. neuroplasticity or placebos work in these cases? That's a good question. They do have placebos. Yeah. What's the name for it? Sensation of, of, of ants all over. They do have it. When you're asking why, you can be treated using mirrors or some kind of perfect technique of, of that sort. As I have tried, it's a very good idea. Exactly what it is not clear. And uh, it harks back to what I said about maybe the mirror of ego, which would be leading to mirror neurons, maybe. But let's say some other question before I do that. Back there, the yellow shirt, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here, sir. It's a pleasure to attend your lecture. Uh, my question is very much into the context of the phantom penis. And uh, so I want to know that the uh, when we talk about phantom limb or the image mirror, mirror therapy, we are talking about the, uh, the developed organ or the organ which exists and it, then it, it's not there. But uh, what in the context of the uh, trans men's and uh, their length like of the phantom penis which you're working on, can you update a bit on that? And uh, also that can we uh, say that the neuron connectivity and the structures are different for such person or like, like for such people. Uh, and also, uh, does social brain plays any sort of role in the development of uh, the brain of such people? Yeah. <laughs> I think she was asking whether about the phantom penis, right? And uh, uh, can, you, can you repeat? My ears are clogged up from the yeah. air so the, in the phantom penis, uh, mm -hmm. so when we talk about phantom limb or uh, about the mirror, uh, mirror image therapy, uh, we are talking about the organ which has developed and then does not exist anymore. Mm, good, okay, yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. And uh, I'm talking in the context of the trans men where the organ doesn't exist, but the, you know, the dysphoria and the, uh, the sense of that, uh, having that organ, uh, how does it, uh, how, 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 how it is there, and is there any scientific explanation? Also, does neurons plays any, like, is there any different sort of neuron connectivity and the structures in the brain of such people? And does the social brain plays any role in, uh, in this uh, scenario? Of transgenders, is it? Of trans men specifically. Trans men, trans yeah. men. Oh, trans men, yeah. Who are genetically men and trans uh, converting young people? Both ways, vice versa. Both ways, vice versa. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm not an expert on this. My, my colleague is Dr. Um, Paul, Paul McGill. Dr. McGill, MCGUH. He has written a bunch of 
he's in my lab. He wasn't my lab. He was extensively in my lab. I think he managed this issue, not his lawyer, managed this issue of sexual differences, slightly unorthodox. What it involves is, I think, that the fetus develops a cascade of events towards sexuality applied to many, many, many aspects of development, parallel development. One is morphology, anatomy, anatomically of male or female, obvious, gross anatomy. Another is the genetic, the, sorry, the chromosomal sense. What are the chromosomes? Let's do most reductions. Third is sexual identity. Uh, what do I see myself as? Then sexual body image. You actually feel phantom body parts and phantom breasts. In fact, you were the first to show that that happens. You don't know for sure that it happens, but it seems to happen on the other hand. Sir, can we show that they have different neuron structures, like the brain structure, the connectivity of the neurons that are about? Do they have different neuron structures, these, these people? Yeah. And perhaps you should remember Laura Case. She studied that. And it turns out that you do get physiological changes. Yeah. yeah. For, yeah. For, for example, phantom breasts in, in these people, the men, the men do, women transsexual. And do you think the social brain plays a role here in the upbringing of the mother? Does the social brain play a role? Yeah. It does, yeah, I'm sure it does. But to what extent? It gets a little bit too um, vague. It doesn't mean it's not real. I prefer to study it a little bit more concrete. And even that I'm treading on thin ice. So it's going to be written trans, trans, you know, very carefully study it. It has not been done yet. No, 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 not even by our lab. But these are good questions you're raising. It's hard to answer. And undoubtedly, I believe it plays a great role. But not to the extent you imagine. The famous case, I think all of you know the famous case of this uh, girl, Diane, you know, man. Girl who was raised a boy, call a pen to write about this girl, born anatomically a girl, but showed constant predilection to a behavior of quote unquote feminine. And they actually did surgery on it, converted it, and the surgery was done and for a few weeks, months it worked, but then reverted back to the genetic template. So the genetic template is much more strong than we realize. To put everything to nurture the nature, but in fact, nature is very, has a very strong, powerful influence on sexual development. Not something you've studied carefully, but a bit worried about its political misuse. Right. Uh, yes, go ahead. We'll probably have time just for one more question after this. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Sashi. Uh, my is a human question, not scientific. You, in, you came up with a brilliant solution for the phantom arm and phantom limb problem. I uh, would like to know what thought process led you to use a mirror to solve the problem, which normally is not associated. Thank you. Amputation of the leg. When you put a mirror in the middle of the you get the same phenomenon again. If visual optical illusion, the amputated leg has come back. Then you move the normal leg, you get the same movement as the phantom, you get relief. By the way, I to mention that the relief is only seen in about one or three, one or three patients. Without the mirror, you might see in one out of eight or nine. So you can increase the odds of eliminating the patients. They eliminate all patients, certainly not. But that's a pretty good rate of recovery in prison medicine. But sorry, that's an important aside for people who want to try this. Important bear that bear that in mind. Be optimistic. More than half the patients get relief. But if you don't do it at all, 10% get relief. So good idea to try it. Sorry, I'm going away from the question. So what led you to think of the mirror? No. Oh. <laughs> that's a very difficult question. What makes you think of it? There was a mirror lying around in the office. <laughs> that's all, that's all it was. And then, and then I was thinking of BR, virtual reality, right? not spending a million dollars on this, contracting counter, right? Five dollars, you put it in there, and you get the arm back, and you get it done. And there's no, no, at one point of time, like, 
figure it out consciously. Okay, the very last question, yes, we'll come back to you. Go ahead. One thing I mentioned, my, my, my mentor, Professor Richard Gregory, who was, who was my teacher, my uh, guru, obsessed with mirrors. Mirrors, mirrors are fascinating, think about it. Whether you are a... Go ahead. So is placebo effect an underrated... Uh, analysis? Can you speak up? Even I can't hear you. Just speak up. So is the placebo effect an underrated way of analyzing a person's behavior? And where is the fine line between uh, differing a placebo effect and, uh, and a scientific... Uh, real things. Real changes, basically. And also like... This is a completely different question. So how does, uh, how do you prove arrival of thought in the brain? And uh, at what, what are the indications to show that hence uh, thought has arrived in your brain? Is it like fMRI scans? I remember having a conversation with my friend nearby and I think he would better explain it if he'd like to join it. But this is what I remember. Like basic question is how does thought arrive and like how do you prove it? Second, the first question was placebo effect. Is it like a real analysis? I mean, uh, no, is it an underrated analysis, etc. Thanks, sir. The first question on placebo is an underrated analysis. It's a good question. Other questions have been nebulous. I don't, I don't understand. First question, placebo is And I agree, it's underrated. Very important. In fact, when I read about placebos, most of one recent report, not 10 years ago, I report. You know what placebo is? Pink pill. Testing a new drug, its efficacy for pain. You don't always have to compare it with pink pill because sometimes people recover from a so called drug, not because of the drug, but in spite of the drug. My company, I don't know, spontaneous remission is very common in neurology and in many areas of medicine. So, placebo is definitely a valid real effect. But what's extraordinary is the placebo works even if you know it's a placebo. That's I mean, interesting. Give me a placebo, you know it's a placebo, but it works. And it works. In other words, you can take a medicine shown to be a placebo, controlled trials, you still use it as a medicine, it works. I don't know why it's not more work. I mean, I started praying when I read that. Get it? So, is it that the medicine is actually taking effect and uh, not that the placebo is really there? Is that what you're saying, sir? That there is a medicinal side to the effect which is the truth which you just claimed. You think placebo actually does change the brain? Is that what you're asking? No, no, I said like, uh, is the medicinal effect actually taking place? Suppose you're taking a medicine for like fever, right? Mm. And how do we draw the line? Like what is this neuroscience proving uh, to show that like there is a placebo and that this is not a placebo, that's all I want to know. First, that's easy to do, we do statistics. 100 people are getting 50 pink pills, told it's a very effective pill or not. Another 50 are getting real pill. Then the difference, when you give the same suggestion, there's a difference, genuine difference in the data, then you say it's not a placebo, it's real. You find it evens out, then, then you know it's, it's, it's a placebo. I'm talking about invisible symptoms though, like Right, I think we have to <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have to close this there now. Uh, maybe you can have a separate chat with him after this, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any, uh, I'm, I'm afraid we can't take any more questions. We've, uh, we've run out of time and they have a lunch break and back to class. So uh, on behalf of all of us here, all that remains for me to do is thank uh, Dr. Dr. <laughs> has been, as always, a very fascinating uh, exploration. Uh, into the human mind and the human brain. Thank you very much. Thank you.